We have lost most of Shaughnessy and Dunn's squad. The Gunny is dead. First platoon is in worse shape. That medic is either crazy or the bravest man alive. Now we roundly with the first. The try for the Naboos. It's here to the left. To the right, it goes right through a pass with two Naboos and Infilate. Mate, we can I lose everyone. The lieutenant. Get back off this bridge. They'll start walking the mortars back to their own positions. We only have I'm minutes. I'm in charge here, Sergeant. Get your men off the bridge, Lieutenant. What's your unit, Sergeant? We don't have time for this, Lieutenant. What's your unit, Sergeant? I company 22nd Marines, Lieutenant. And we just saved your ass by fording the river. My orders are to reconnoiter the... I think that point is now moot. You have ten men left. My orders are to save what's left. Move out! Earl Phelps, a shooting at the 111 Club, 6232 Hollywood Boulevard. Sounds like a homicide beef. Two of the dead guys caught in the crossfire were carrying army surplus morphine. Get over there before homicide tramples all over the place. We already cleared that up. Judge in Pasadena took the big sleep yesterday. He had a personal stash of 20 cigarettes. Appears we didn't get all of it. Roy just can't start a case without arguing about it. God damn it. Just can't seem to put this morphine to sleep. A dead judge. It's not good. Everyone has their vices. Even you, Phelps. Yeah, well, how would Roy know? What does he do? Follow Cole around town? Heading down to the parking lot, we can take Roy's car to the scene. Parker and Green are going toe-to-toe for the top job. There's a change in the wind. About time. This wind will be like a tornado, Phelps. Parker's got a puritanical streak. You never know we'll get swept up in a thing like that. We first heard about Detective Green during the Red Lipstick murder. Even then, he was rumored to be campaigning for the police chief's job. Looks like his own partner, Parker, has decided to campaign against him. We arrive at the 111 Club at 4.26 p.m. Homicide guys are already inside. Inside, we find a familiar face. Bukowski, Phelps, back again. We're here about the morphine. Over by the bandstand, you can see what's left of the owner, Eddie McGoldrick, 26, former Marine. I know Eddie McGoldrick. He was a non-com in my old unit. Uh, I'm sorry to hear that, Cole. Waitress said he recently came into some money and bought the club. Who were the other Vicks? Two musicians, Biddleston and Bo. And get this, they used to be in a four-piece, but the trombone player and the drummer OD'd. Don't tell me. Lamont and Tyree... We've met the rest of the band. Now they're a no piece. <laughs> Do you mind if we take a look around? Be my guest. You might want a word with the hostess, too. I'll keep her company until you're ready. Roy with his quips. He goes off to do something, sparing us of his humor. We can examine one of the corpses, riddled with bullet holes. Must have pumped a dozen rounds into him. Certainly sends a message. Heading towards the stage, we can examine what's at evidence marker B, a trumpet case. Well-maintained, custom case. Someone cared for this instrument. We can inspect one of the mouthpieces, but as we put it back... What's that click? Huh. Trying again. We definitely hear a click, but not when we examine the trumpet itself. Examining the next mouthpiece... Well, what do you know? And examining the middle one. Neat trick. The case must have cost more than the trumpet. Inside, we find a bunch of drug paraphernalia, but the biggest clue we find is a ticket. We should follow up on the musician angle. Another ticket for the Blue Room Jazz Club. We first came across this ticket during the Black Caesar Vice case. In that case, we found two jazz musicians who had OD'd on morphine. They had also recently played at the Blue Room. That gives us reason enough to finally check out the place. And right next to the ticket... He kept his stash close at hand. A morphine syringe. Same drug, same musicians, same club. Next, we'll head over to the stiff at evidence marker C. He lies in a pool of his own blood. Cause of death is plain to see. We don't find anything on the corpse until we inspect his inside jacket pocket. We have a new source, or is this coming from what's left in circulation? 
Another serrette of army issue morphine. Looks like the whole band was using. Standing up, we find a doorway against the wall. Heading inside, we find a huge opened crate of cigarettes. A dozen packs to a carton, a hundred cartons or more. Looks like a couple of months supply. The Valor Tobacco Company. A crate of cartons of Valor cigarettes. For personal use or to make a quick buck. And next to this, we find some rifles. These look brand new. Never fired. They haven't been degreased yet. We could check on the serial numbers. Is this guy hunting for bear? Look at these things. They're BARs. You get the odd guy who sneaks one of them home from the war. How did he get three of them? Army surplus morphine, army surplus weapons, army surplus valors. Sound familiar? We should get back to the station and check the details of what exactly was lifted from that ship. Army issue BARs, never used. So from everything we see here, it wasn't just morphine stolen from the ship. These guys took whatever they could sell on the streets of LA. When done exploring the stage, we can head back to the bar to interrogate the hostess. Ma'am, I'm Detective Phelps, Administrative Vice Squad. Welcome to the 111 Club, Detective. Feels like I've had half the LAPD in here today already. We'll start by having us tell her about the shooting incident in her own words. Any idea who did the shooting? No idea. It was my day off. If I had been here, honey, I'd be full of holes just like the others. And yet she's dressed so nice. What, did she hear about the incident and race on over? Maybe she was heading to a movie with a friend. At any rate, she makes a good point. If she had been here, we would have found her body. And yet she is not holding herself like a woman who has nothing to hide. She's irritable, hand on her hip, restless, itching to get out of here. Is it just because she's already been questioned by LA's finest all day? Or is that just the impression she's trying to give, hoping Cole won't pry any deeper to avoid making her angry? This how you usually solve a crime? But that's not the kind of detective that Cole is. So to get more out of her, we're gonna play bad cop. You wanna level with me, miss, before we start taking an interest in you? This place has been on the slide for years. Eddie turns up, buys the club, then we start getting visits from tough guys. Next thing you know, we have the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Are you getting the picture? So Eddie bought the place recently. Sounds like the hostess here had been working long before Eddie showed up. If that's the case, then she's known him the entire time he's owned the 111 Club. We'll ask her what she knew about Eddie. Tell us about Eddie. Eddie didn't know a thing about running a nightclub. He came into some money and waltzed in and bought the place. The previous owner thought all his Christmases had come at once. Yes, I imagine he would. How exactly did Eddie come into money? What, a early inheritance? Some long-lost millionaire uncle? Or did he recently make a big sale? We don't get the impression that she's steering us the wrong way. She no longer looks irritable or frustrated to be there. Looks like a bit of bad cop was all she needed to straighten out. She stands relaxed and meets eyes with Cole. She's telling the truth. Where do you think he got the money? My guess was that he was selling the sort of quality product that you don't need to advertise. Thank you for your help, ma'am. Eddie was in over his head, but he was a decent boss. So a decent guy. But a decent guy peddling what? Valors and even guns? On our way out, we see a doorway at the end of the hall that we missed upon entry. Here, we find the body of Eddie, Cole's old comrade who served with him at Okinawa. Bad luck, Eddie. Okinawa couldn't kill you, but knowing the wrong people in this city... We don't find anything on the corpse. Nothing in his jacket pockets, but nearby we find an opened floor safe. They didn't even try to crack the safe. And they left all the money. And Eddie didn't even reach for his pistol. So if this wasn't a robbery gone bad, what's left? Revenge? Dare I say, justice? We walk away with only one clue. That ticket to the Blue Room. Heading to Roy's car, we can have him take us there. We arrive at the Blue Room at 5.33 p.m. I recognize that guy from the papers. He's a cop. Heading inside, we find some jazz musicians practicing. And here we find Elsa, 
a lounge singer whom Roy himself first introduced us to many cases ago. At that time, we found Elza crying. Something had recently happened to her that broke her heart, and Roy responded by slapping her. And why would I want to meet another fascist from the LAPD? Sorry about this, Cole. What an evening I'm having. First a Negro puts his hands on me, and then this. Who do you think you're talking to, you German junkie whore? Don't you ever forget your place with me again. Do you hear me? Hopefully we'll find her in a better mood today. Take a break, boys. We would like them to stay, Miss Lickman. We're making inquiries into the recent deaths of four musicians. Since when have the police cared about dead black men? Good point. We don't. What we care about is two tons of army surplus morphine showing up on the street. If you care about working in this town, you better give me something on Biddleston and Bo. Or their knucklehead buddies, Tyree and Lamont. And this is your idea of making inquiries, Undustunfuhrer? I've told you a thousand times about speaking that German gibberish at me, Elsa. Roy! How about you get a drink while I see to this? This time, Cole's able to intervene first before Roy smacks her in the face. Will you sit down? Why antagonize him, Elsa? You know what he's capable of. Ask your questions, head officer. We have work to do. Elsa here worked closely with the jazz musicians, many of whom have already shown up dead and had been carrying the army surplus morphine. It's doubtful she could have been working with them for so long without knowing about this, so we'll start by asking her exactly what she knows. People are dying of overdoses. If you know anything about it, you need to tell me. I can't help you. A lot of cats are into the thing. There's nothing special about your boys. Elsa's not being helpful. And yet, what is this? She's meeting eyes with Cole, giving him half a smile, and every now and then, her left eyebrow flits up ever so briefly. She looks comfortable, confident, but she's not being helpful in any way. Despite her warm body language, we'll play bad cop to see if we can get anything out of her. You can do this the easy way with me, or I can call my partner back over. I can assure you he's a lot less sensitive. You think your threats frighten me? Black man don't supply nothing. You think there's a black man in this town holding on to two tons of morphine? He'd be dead in a minute. White man supplies, black man buys. Well, thankfully her buddy piped up. We're getting nothing from Elsa, but lots of commentary from the gallery. Next, we'll ask her if she knows anything about the morphine overdose victims. My partner mentioned a couple of names. You recognize them? I have no idea what you're talking about. Ah, disappointing. We know she likely worked with Tyrone and Lamont and all of the others. They were all part of the same nightclub jazz community, working at many of the same clubs around L.A., including this one. It's extremely unlikely that she wouldn't have at least met them. And yet she claims here that she's never heard of them. Now, we don't have any evidence that she has heard from them. All of the evidence we have about the other guys were from other cases, and we don't have that now. Also, her body language has changed, and it's bizarre. She steadfastly maintains eye contact with Cole, but every now and then she squints her eyes a little bit and grimaces as if she's in pain, which is really weird. Why would she be in pain? Is it physical pain or... Maybe emotional pain. Maybe she really did know Tyrone Lamont and all of the others, and she knows what happened to them. She knew about their vices, and she learned what happened to them. Maybe she really cared for them. And when Cole brings up their deaths, it brings up a lot of painful memories. Could this be why she's acting the way she is? We don't have evidence that she knew them, but based on some deduction and her body language, we'll again use Bad Cop to get her to tell us more. The only way you're going to get rid of me is to give me an answer. I knew Cornell. We worked together a few years ago. He loved the music, but the music didn't love him. What does that mean? It means that he just wasn't that good. He was a sad, lonely cat. Boys, take five minutes, please. I need to have a private word with the officer. 
Why do you ask people to risk talking about a subject that could have them jailed? Drugs are against the law, Elsa. And you're so full of courage, you have never felt ashamed. This is getting us nowhere. Do you think you'll win your war against narcotics? It's not my war. It's against the law. My job is to prosecute the laws of this city. Do you think you can stop people from needing drugs, detective? I'm asking the questions here. Then why do you come to me with your stupid questions? You know who controls the drugs in this city. It's not enough to just survive, Elsa. You have to try and make the world a better place. Brave words and very noble. But... Words are just words, Colfabs. She's right. We need to pay a visit to the mixer. Cohen, do you know where to find him? This time of day, you'll find him holding court at the Macambo. He can wait. There's something I need to be sure of. Give me till tomorrow morning. Don't do anything I wouldn't do, partner. All right. And with that, Cole goes off to do some private investigating. There's something he needs to be sure of. And so he uncharacteristically postpones the case. We find him in his car, uh, waiting outside the nightclub. Oh, okay. It's Elsa. Looks like he's gonna tail her. She hops into a yellow cab, and we need to maintain a safe distance. We have no partner in the car this time yelling at us. So skipping to the end, we tail her all the way to her apartment complex. She gets out tips the driver, and then darts inside. When out of eyesight, Cole gets out of the car and walks to the main gate. He waits a moment, watching her go inside. Then when the coast is clear, walks up the stairs to enter. All right, exactly what are you trying to find, Cole? Uh, Cole tails her to her room. and appears to be having some sort of internal struggle. What are you doing? You couldn't be. No, don't do it, Cole. No. What are you thinking? Get out of there before she opens the door. Cole! arrives at the Macombo Club at 11.25 the next morning. Without a word, Roy and Cole enter to see if Mickey Cohen is here for lunch. LAPD, we're looking for Mayor Cohen. I believe he has lunch here. There's not going to be any trouble, is there? Which table? Number three, if you'll follow me. Looks like the host knows Mickey's reputation. Sirs, Mr. Cohen's table is this way. LAPD, we have some questions Hi, regarding... Mickey. How's it hanging? Fine. Just fine, Roy. I see you brought Iga Beaver along. Hope he's not going to put the shakes on me again. Cole Phelps, Mickey Cohen. Good afternoon. <laughs> he has manners. Aren't you a little green for this kid? Me, Johnny Stompanato, Cole. He has the biggest schlong in Hollywood and the smallest gun. Or maybe that's the other way around. I can never quite remember. You're a funny guy, Roy. Haven't I always said what a funny guy Roy is? And how much fun it would be to get together with him sometime. Poor Johnny. He's the dark, sensitive type. He's a serviceman too, Cole. Johnny was in Okinawa. You were in the crotch? Sixth Marines. The lieutenant who won the Silver Star upon Sugarloaf. I've heard of you. Something like that. All right, have we finished flirting? You got something to discuss, Roy? You're gonna stand around beating the meat while my lunch gets cold. We have some questions. Do I need my lawyer? Uh, You know, boy talk. We'll start by talking about Lenny the Fink's morphine operation, the one we busted in our very first Vice case. The one where we killed Lenny the Fink, Cohen's own brother-in-law. I think your bright spark might have blown a fuse, Roy. Hey, you still there, kid? Your brother-in-law, Lenny Finkelstein, was selling stolen morphine. He had one-third of the shipment. Old news, kid. I don't know anything about what Lenny was up to. Oh, yeah, took him a little bit to come up with that line. 
Mickey Cohen, mob boss, one of the most dangerous men in all of L.A., sits here looking extremely nervous. His eyes dart from side to side, and he just can't keep his mouth shut. Sometimes it just hangs open, as if his tongue is about to loll out. For everything he says about Cole and his greenness as a new detective, he's the one who feels the hot seat. We can't use any evidence we've collected from previous cases, but based on our experience, we know that he's lying here, and so we'll play a bit of bad cop. So I'm supposed to believe that you don't know what happened to the rest of the shipment? Lenny, God rest his soul, was a moron. He was family, though, and I haven't made a beef about that, so count yourself lucky, kid. The H is a filthy habit, and I don't condone it. The simple solution would be to have all the dope fiends put down. So you don't know where he got the morphine? Kid, ask a question you might get an answer to. Well then, that means yes, he knows where the morphine came from, but he's reluctant to tell us. Maybe he can loosen his lips a bit to talk about the 111 club shooting. We believe there's a link between a group of Marines and the morphine stolen from the SS Coolridge. One of those Marines was shot to death in a club last night. I wouldn't know anything about that. He says smiling, meaning he likely has everything to do with that, and here he gets really nervous. If his eyes were moving in the last question, they're practically ping-pong balls now. Every now and then his mouth will open again, but this time he gulps big. We don't have evidence that Mickey had anything to do with the shooting, but basic deduction and his body language convinces us to doubt his story. So you haven't heard anything about what happened at the 111 Club? What can I say, kid? I'm shocked that in the land of opportunity, Uncle Sam's finest feel the need to resort to crime. It's a dangerous business. I can attest to that. I'd recommend they get out of the life. Quickly. A few Negroes saying goodbye on the sidewalk will never make the papers, Mickey. But we had a judge in Pasadena say adios the other day. Prominent white people popping their clogs makes everyone me? nervous. You know dope has never been my thing, Roy. It's always been for Schmendricks, like uh, Jack D and Jimmy Utley. But uh, I'll ask around and I'll get back to you. Hey, you boys want some lunch? How about a drink? We'll take a rain check on that. Come on, Cole, we're leaving. We have to cut that dope. It looks bad with people dying. We have to get the rest of it. There's no way of watering down the stuff in those little packages. We have to put the squeeze on those guys and get the rest of it. They don't seem to type the fright that easy. We'll see. Going on. That fucking rat stoker has gone public about Brenda. Who is Brenda? Brenda is LA's most famous madam. And everyone knows it? Of course everyone knows. Brenda pays her way. Are we cops or a collection agency? Whores have been around since the Bible. Our job is to keep it off the street so Joe Citizen and his wife can stroll around unmolested. Then we should change the law. Are you out of your mind? Every politician in America is against prostitution. Except when they're using them. So where does Stoker come in? He objects to the LAPD and the administration taking its cut. Is everyone in on this? Yeah, and that's the problem. From a little acorn does a large tree grow. He could bring the whole thing crashing down on us. Aren't you supposed to be working the... Sir, do you know which robbery detectives are working the army surplus theft from the Coolidge? Caldwell and McManus. I saw Caldwell in the squad room not long ago if you want to speak to him. Thank you, sir. We'll do that. This way. This scandal with Brenda really happened, though the events were somewhat different. The real Brenda was a madam in L.A. who was sleeping with a one Sergeant Jackson when a robber broke in and Jackson shot him dead. When their relationship became known, her relationship with other prominent members of the L.A. Police Department became known, and this led to major reform within the LAPD. Sounds like a similar situation has happened here, only with a guy named Stoker. Harry, you got a minute? Sure, Cole, any time. You've been working the docks robbery on the SS Coolridge? Yeah, that's right. So how do you see it? Inside job. Either the guys working the wharves or some of the guys on the ship. What else was taken apart from the morphine? A case of BARs, a case of Thompsons, a crate of Valor Smokes. Homicide just recovered three BARs and a mountain of cigarettes at a shooting at the 111 Club. No kidding. I better get over there. Do you have a copy of the manifest? Yeah. Here it is. 
I say we bust in there and find so the guy. So how do we connect the docks robbery to the mess at the 111 Club? Here we find a list of many of the very same men Cole served with in Okinawa. We already recognize two names on this manifest from the newspaper flashbacks. Courtney Sheldon and Jack Kelso. And Edward McGoldrick. Eddie! He was on the same ship home as Jack and Courtney. But moving on to the other page, we see a list of all of the items that have gone missing. 400 submachine guns. Enough to arm three companies. 300 BARs. Here's our backroom arsenal from the 111 Club. 960 pounds worth of Valor cigarettes. This is the crate we recovered. And holy cow, two tons of morphine. Half a million cigarettes loose on the streets of L.A. Some of these guys are from my old unit. They must have finally shipped home. Kelso, Sheldon, McGoldrick. McGoldrick was on the boat? Sure, we checked him out. McGoldrick bought the 111 Club, Harry. His brains are all over the bar. Looks like whoever stole the dope is getting muscled. By whom? Dragner or Cohen. They control the hop. Detectives, KGPL's going crazy. Shots fired at 1384 North Bronson. Some guy with an automatic spraying a Hollywood bus. They want every car. Go! Racing down to the parking lot, we can have Roy take us there. All units, officers need help at 1384 North Bronson. 1384 North Bronson, shots fired. Any units to handle, identify. Code 3. We arrive at the scene of the bus shooting at 12.05 p.m. pistol we've got can't even compete with this guy's automatic weapon. So racing back to Roy's car, we can pop the trunk to see what he's got. He's got a shotgun and a submachine gun. We'll take the submachine gun for now. There's no way we can get a good shot at him from out front. So going into a nearby alleyway, we find a ladder leading to a fire escape. Taking the fire escape to the roof, we can hide behind some large tanks to fire upon the assailant. Lucky shot. Looks like the passengers have been evacuated. Roy joins us on the roof, and we can head to the corpse of the assassin to search for clues. We don't find anything in his hands, but after inspecting his jacket pocket... Phone number and restaurant table. Will you look at that? He happens to know the phone number of Mickey Cohen's favorite restaurant and even his favorite table. Highly coincidental. Seems like whomever was sitting at that table gave him some directions. To target a guy named Alvaro who was driving a Route 217 bus and that he could find that bus at Hollywood and Sunset between 12 and 2 p.m. This is the hit that Mickey Cohen put out for a guy named Alvaro, who must have been driving the bus. Nearby, we find the weapon that he was using. Sure enough. It's one of the BARs. Stolen from the Cool Ridge. Back on the ground, we can try and talk to Alvaro. I know that guy. Felix Alvaro. He's one of the guys from the ship? His name was on the manifest. Looks like McGoldrick wasn't the only one to get a message. Hey, Alvaro. Hey, Lieutenant. He's just a plain detective now, Chico. Who's the jughead? This is my partner, Roy Earl. We just want to find out what happened. What happened is that someone took a shot at my bus. And the cops turned up and started treating me like I'm some sort of pachuco punk. My people have been in California for over 300 years. Very fucking admirable, Felix. Highly coincidental that the people who are dying today are all former Marines. Not just former Marines, but former members of Cole's unit. And not just former members of Cole's unit, but all Marines who came back to L.A. on the same ship. With that information in mind, I wonder exactly what Felix has to say about the Cool Ridge heist. You hear anything about the big heist on the Cool Ridge? Yeah, I heard about it. 
So what happened? Not much. Uh, the cops came and interviewed me and all the other guys on the ship. No, not what happened after you learned about it. What happened during the heist? Clever way to answer that question, Felix. He's being very careful with his words here, and he's not entirely comfortable. Hands behind his back, leaning slightly forward, licking his lips, pursing his lips, gulping every now and then, blinking a heck of a lot, and not maintaining eye contact with Cole. We already suspect that he knows something, but his countenance gives us even more reason to doubt his story. Let's see how much he squirms when he learns that other men from his own unit have already bitten the dust. I was down at the 111 Club this morning, waiting for the medical examiner to scrape Eddie McGoldrick's brains off the bar. You want to tell me anything about that? I heard that Eddie came into some money. Too bad he didn't keep a low profile. It was a tough break to get through Okinawa and then have to buy it back home. And I'm sure Felix here would know all about keeping a low profile if he were to come into some money. After all, what better way to keep a low profile than to become a bus driver? An honest, nine-to-five working, good old American bus driver. Very clever, Felix. Which brings us to the next question. Why exactly would a trained assassin be trying to kill a bus driver? Who's shooting at you, Felix? How the fuck do I know? The last time, he was uncomfortable in a scheming, I know something you don't know sort of way. This time, he's uncomfortable in a, oh my god, they really tried to kill me, I'm in serious water, but I can't let Cole know sort of way. His arms are now crossed in front of him. His gulps are even bigger than last time. He briefly makes eye contact with Cole, then blinks even more than before. And he's shifting his weight a heck of a lot. But this time, we have proof that he's lying. The dead guy on the roof works for Mickey Cohen. Why would Cohen want you dead? Man, I don't know anything about Mickey Cohen or, or any of those gangsters. He knows enough about them to know that Mickey Cohen's a gangster. But the evidence we have to prove that he's lying is his name and his bus route in a notebook that the sniper took to a meeting with Mickey Cohen at the Macambo, where Mickey paid the guy to kill Alvaro. Mickey doesn't just call out hits for no reason. And if Mickey had a reason to kill Felix, Felix likely knows what that reason is. Your name was in the sniper's notebook. Level with me, Felix. Cohen thinks because we were on the boat, we have the morphine. Courtney's meeting those guys to sort it out. Courtney Sheldon? Yeah. You remember Sheldon, don't you, Cole? We'll be in touch, Felix. You heard that Jack is in L.A.? I saw his name on the manifest. He's been here a couple of months. I'm sure glad to see you got over your wound, Lieutenant. I mean, Detective. Pretty cool customer. He's been under fire before. You buying a story? Not for a minute. Ooh. That very cool exchange is even more painful to watch when we know more about what Cole did at Okinawa. But that story doesn't come out until much later in the game. That said, there's a reason Cole became visibly uncomfortable when Stampanato mentioned his Silver Star earlier in the episode. The lieutenant won the Silver Star upon Sugarloaf. I've heard of you. Something like that. All but right. Alvaro mentioned that Kelso was back in town and that Courtney Sheldon was involved. We know this from the newspaper flashbacks, but this is all news to Cole Phelps. And so we can take Cole to the nearby Gamwell to get an address for Jack Kelso. Phelps, badge 1247. How could I help, Detective? I need an address on a Jack Kelso. Just a second. Jack Kelso, apartment 4, 1408 North El Centro Avenue, Hollywood. With the address in hand, we can have Roy take us to Jack's apartment. How well did you know the owner? Goldrick? Well enough. He was in my unit. That's some cruel irony. You survive the war, then get blown to pieces back home. It happens more than you'd think. Young guys trying to adjust to normal life, getting mixed up in the wrong crowds. The kid had just bought a nightclub. I'd say he got mixed up in the right crowds. Until someone filled him full of holes. You don't come into that kind of money that quickly without pissing a few people off. Especially if one of those people is a guy named Mickey Cohen. We arrive at Jack Kelso's apartment at 2.15 p.m. And just in time to see him walking home.
Hello, Jack. This is Detective Roy Earl. Hello, Cole. We would like a word. Would you like to come inside? Actually, we'd prefer if you'd come downtown with us. Do you mind? Do I have any choice? No. You don't. Are you going to tell me what this is all about? It would be better for all of us if we discussed it at the station. Bad move, Cole. How have you been, Jack? Cut the crap. You pick me up in front of my apartment like a common criminal and then expect small talk? Fuck you. Ooh, yeah. Why doesn't Cole have any friends from the war? We arrive at Hollywood Station at 3.35 p.m. Heading inside, we can move into interview room two. We'll start with the basics, see what Jack here knows about the stolen army issue morphine. Do you know that there's a gang war going on in L.A. trying to recover that stolen morphine? That has nothing to do with me. Maybe not, but if it doesn't, he sure does have an odd reaction. Instead of sitting here confident that it has nothing to do with him, he sits here rolling his eyes, looking exasperated, meeting eyes with Cole, then looking up and rolling his eyes again. He's doing his best to make this all about how much he dislikes Cole Phelps, which of course distracts from what he may or may not know about the stolen morphine. You okay, Phelps? Standing around, doing nothing? You look shell-shocked. Oh, oh. also that comment there. That was a nasty blow in light of what went on with Cole and his unit at Okinawa. But again, at this moment in the game, we don't have that information. At any rate, we don't have evidence that Kelso is lying here, but we have enough to doubt that he's telling us the truth. I'm sure it would be gripping to hear more of your life story, boys, but the truth is, I don't give a fuck. You were on the boat, Kelso. What happened? Do you really think a bunch of Marines could muscle in on the dope rackets in this town? Between the vice squad and the mob, I hear it's pretty sewn up. You better watch your mouth. <laughs> I think I like Kelso if he can piss off Roy like that. Of course, Kelso was right. The vice squad is making more money off the dope racket than these Marines are. Next, we'll talk with Kelso about Eddie Goldrick. Did you know that Eddie McGoldrick recently came into money and bought a nightclub? No, I didn't know that. Now, we know from previous episodes that he's been helping Courtney Sheldon trying to get Mickey Cohen off his back, so presumably he knows all about the Cool Ridge heist. Here he says he doesn't know that Eddie came into a bunch of money, but he would if he knew that Eddie was part of the Cool Ridge heist. Maybe his I don't know was that Eddie spent that money on the nightclub. At any rate, he stands here looking incredibly comfortable. He's not shifting his weight. He's meeting eyes with Cole. The correct answer here is to play good cop. And you didn't know that some mobsters blew his brains out last night? No, I didn't. When he was standing in that alley looking tough to Mickey Cohen, it was all words at that point. But now Mickey's goons are killing the men from his own unit. It has suddenly become very real. We can next ask Kelso about the weapons stolen from the Cool Ridge. You heard that a crate of BARs went missing? No, I didn't. And again, despite presumably knowing about the Cool Ridge heist in order to defend Courtney Sheldon, he does seem to be unaware that BARs went missing. His hands are on the table, he meets eyes with Cole, he is relaxed and comfortable. The correct answer is truth. I saw Felix Alvaro today. Good. How was he? A little pale. One of Mickey Cohen's goons had emptied about 60 BAR rounds into the bus he was driving. A public bus in the middle of Hollywood. Are you going to tell me what's going on? Or do more innocent people have to die? Yeah, and what's in it for you, Cole? Newspapers? More glory? Another promotion? Another medal at the expense of men who fought for their country? Count me out. Ooh, what exactly is their history? Finally, we can come right out and ask him if he knows anything about the robbery. What do you know about the Army surplus robbery from the Cool Ridge, Jack? What I know is that on three separate occasions, you would have been dead if it weren't for me. I don't know anything about the robbery. So making sure Cole knows that Cole owes him before answering the question, that's not at all suspicious. And suddenly his behavior and countenance changes. He's maintaining eye contact, but he's gulping huge gulps. He has now clasped his hands together. It looks like he's even sweating. We know from the newspapers that he knows what happened at the Cool Ridge, and his countenance here betrays it. We'll doubt his story. 
People are dying because morphine intended to help servicemen is being used on the street. Now we have guys from our old unit being killed by mobsters. We can put two and two together, Jack. Gratitude isn't a concept that has much effect on you, is it, Cole? Answer the question, Jack. Let's get this over with. I was interviewed when the robbery took place. I don't have anything further to add. Jack, we just want information. Bullshit, Cole. Did you seriously believe that dragging me down here would get me to give up my own guys? You call yourself a Marine? Trying to make a name for yourself with this shit heel? Look at this chump with his $200 suit and $2,000 car. The tough guy act is really impressive. I like you, Jack. I'd like to make you for this. I really would. I'm going to be working on it and keeping an eye on you. You can go now. Shooting Robert Steiner, 6780 West Sunset Boulevard. The victim is a Chris Majewski. Another name from the manifest? Leaving Jack to stew, Cole races to Roy's car and has him drive to Robert Steiner. Talk about tension. That was like being trapped in an elevator with a married couple who can't decide whether they love each other or hate each other. We go back a long way. You went too easy on him. Next time, you leave it to me. I know how to handle that smug son of a bitch. You don't. Jack will never give up his own myth. We arrive at Robert's diner at 4.18 p.m. He just walked up and shot the man. Two of them officers, they went that way. Go on, get after him. Jack was a company sergeant. He would never get involved in something like this. We brace him and drag him downtown. It won't work. He's a tough customer. I can't take the shot from here, Cole! Get him close and steer him off the tar. I can't hit a target that isn't there, Phelps! Sorry, Roy. Hit him! Clear this asshole off the road. Let's see how fast he runs on bare rims. Oh, oh, come on! Step on it, huh? Just give me a little closer. It's no good. We need to get closer. <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh. The crooks went down an alleyway. Hopping out of the car, we can pull a submachine gun from the back and take him out in the alley. Whew -wee. Well, that was a nightmare. With the assassins dead, we can head inside to inspect their corpses. We don't find anything on this fellow until we inspect his inside jacket pocket. And what do you know? An LAPD file. We have a traitor in our midst. All of the names on the list have a hit team assigned to them. Someone got a hold of an LAPD manifest, a copy of the very same one we took a look at earlier in the day. Eddie and Christopher, dead. Looks like the assassins took the time to cross off Christopher's name from the manifest before fleeing the scene of the crime. But this gives us a handy list of all of the upcoming hits and where they'll take place. John Higgins and Patrick Connolly at Browman's Chinese Theater. Walter Beckett and Michael Driscoll at the Hollywood Post Office. If the assassin had already attempted to kill Alvaro at the bus stop and these two goons succeeded in killing Christopher at the diner, well, the other murders could already be underway. We'll be lucky to get there in time. Inspecting his other pocket, Cohen is meeting with Sheldon tonight. Well, this is about as blatant as it gets. Mickey's name is on this paper. He's meeting none other than Sheldon at 9 o'clock at the Newsview building. Wherever that is, frustratingly, we don't have an address. Interestingly, it describes what Sheldon looks like. Mid-twenties, 5'10", dark hair. 
Why would you need that information? Only if you were to assassinate him. If he was one of the assassins, then the News View building must not be the actual place where Mickey and Courtney are meeting, but is more likely the place where this guy was supposed to set up shop to overlook their meeting place to assassinate Courtney. So Sheldon will be arriving for his own assassination at a meeting place with Mickey Cohen at 9 p.m. tonight. We gotta work fast if we're gonna stop these other assassination attempts before this one. We need to get to those guys fast, otherwise there'll be no case. As we head to the second corpse, we find a newspaper on the ground. LAPD vice scandal could go all the way to the top. Stoker tell-all may cost jobs at City Hall. So Stoker, the lover of Brenda Allen, the madam, may give up the secrets he knows about other senior LAPD officials. We have to look at damage limitation. We can't allow that strumpet Brenda Allen to bring down the whole administration. We've got to put a lid on the press. Can't someone talk to Harry over at the Times? It's too late. The Times would look ridiculous if we dropped the story now. Who is this Stoker? Stoker's a lily white. Nothing that will fix this in the short term. My law and order credentials are disappearing as we speak. Can we get Brenda to leave town? Yes, we can, but she won't go quietly. Brenda has extensive records. Can she at least lay low? That's already been taken care of. Mayor? District Attorney? Who is this guy? And what does he want, Horrell? The name's Roy Earl, Detective, Administrative Vice. Aren't you one of the clowns that got us into this mess? Oh, I think that the orders regarding Brenda come down, not up, Mayor. I have a human interest story. It involves a certain LAPD cop, a hero from the war, who has let his beautiful wife and kids down, who has betrayed America for a German junkie whore, who has abandoned his pledge to the LAPD and his commitment to the public, we all serve. Could be all over the papers by tomorrow, and you would be off the hook. So what do you want in return, Roy? fingering a fellow officer. Oh. Oh, Roy. But Cole doesn't know anything about this. Roy just stands there smug, and only we know what he's done. If only Cole could do something about it now. Heading over to the second body, we can't examine it. That's right. We were in a hurry. Let's see. We've either got to go to the Chinese theater or the post office to stop a murder. It doesn't matter which one we go to, so we'll start by going to the Chinese theater. They're taking out all the guys from the ship. Why? How does that get them the dope? They obviously don't know who has the morphine, and they're waiting for someone to crack. We know, but Mickey doesn't know that Courtney gave the morphine to Fontaine. Fontaine disposed of it and used the money to invest in some sort of Homes for Veterans scheme. But we'll dive more into that later. We arrive at Grauman's Chinese Theater at 4.39 p.m. But too late! Get in close and steer them off the tar. We chase after the assassins through the streets of L.A. until we finally run them off the road. LAPD, put your hands in the air! The assassins are dead, but we didn't stop them from killing our shipmates. We've got to head to the Hollywood Post Office as soon as possible to prevent the same thing from happening. But oh no, we arrive at 4.53 p.m. right in the middle of a gunfight. to the back of Roy's car, we can take out a submachine gun. Hiding behind a police car, we can take out a few from the doorways. You're clear, go! We're giving ground, move up! We gotta take the rest of them! Racing up the stairs, we find more behind the counter. 
Heading to the right, we can try to sneak up behind them through a side door. But one is still shooting. We have no choice but to make our way inside. Throw down your gun if you like. I'm still gonna ice. We were too late. Just like Higgins and Conley before him, we find Walter Beckett lying shot on the ground. But he's not dead. <coughs> Tell Courtney. Bad luck. It was worth a try. God. With that, Walter Beckett dies right in front of us, but he gave us some incriminating evidence about Courtney. With this confession, Cole learns that Courtney was the ringleader, and to tie it all together, in his left hand... Polar Bear Ice Company. He really did it. wonder whether it was worth it. Most people never get the chance to be rich. Wouldn't you risk it? This ties the 6th Marines, Cole's own unit, to Lenny Finkelstein, the brother-in-law of Mickey Cohen, the guy we killed in our first vice case, whose Polar Bear Ice Company had one-third of two tons of stolen morphine. Courtney Sheldon sold the morphine to the mob. And this is the evidence. Leaving Beckett, we can go in search of Driscoll. We find his corpse by the P.O. boxes. And inside his jacket pocket... Looks like Sheldon is bringing his own fire team with him. So Sheldon wasn't going in blindly. He was going to Mickey's meeting with the rest of his former unit as backup. Driscoll and likely Beckett here were going to arrive later tonight. And now we finally have an address for this meeting. 1640 North Las Palmas. Juicy Beckett. Goldrick, Driscoll, these are good guys. Why did they get wrapped up in this thing? Not everyone has your unwavering restraint in the face of temptation, Cole. Was that supposed to be sarcasm? But of course, we already know that Roy knows exactly what Cole did last night. Heading to the car, we can have Roy drive us to the site of Sheldon and Cohen's meeting. This isn't looking good. I feel like the fat kid at the back of a race. You sure it's Cohen making the hits? All fingers point his way. Your buddies are in way over their heads. Being a Marine doesn't mean shit out here. We arrive at the meeting place at 9.15 p.m. And just as we pull up, Mickey Cohen races away, leaving his thugs behind. Light him up. All right, let's kill these red bastards. Keep moving, I'll cover you! But that's not all of them. They're everywhere, down the alleys and on the rooftops above us. Climbing a nearby drainage pipe, we can take care of the thugs on the rooftop. Racing to a nearby rooftop, we can take care of the thugs down another alley. I'm gonna find you! I'm gonna put out an APB on every one of the sons of bitches on that alley. APB on the car 11K, car 11 King, come in. Car 11 King! 11K, go to Hollywood Station. Hey, Courtney Sheldon is at Hollywood Station requesting an interview with Detective Cole Phelps. Well, I'll be damned. That's not correct protocol, 11K. I'll take that as a roger. Car 11 King en route. So Sheldon decided not to come to the meeting. Smart man. He must have learned about what happened to the other members of his unit earlier in the day. We arrive at the Hollywood Station at 10.47 p.m. Roy, in my office if you please. I'm working a major case. I'm that close, Cap. It's gonna have to wait. Let Phelps do the interrogation. But Cap, no buts. This is more important. Donnelly takes Roy aside for some reason, and we find Courtney and Fontaine in interview room number two. Sheldon, is this your attorney? No, detective. This is Dr. Harlan Fontaine. He came down here to help me out. How do you do, sir? 
You stole the morphine from the Coolridge. You can't prove that. Let's see if I can try. And what is your relationship to Sheldon, sir? Tudor mentor. Mr. Sheldon is a medical student of mine. He has a very bright future. Oh, that's nice to know. Too bad all of your war buddies won't get to see your graduation. We'll start by seeing if he knows that the rest of the 6th Marines have been targeted by Mickey Cohen. I would have asked Beckett or Majewski or Driscoll about their involvement, but that's difficult, considering they're all dead. That leaves you, Sheldon. You can't blame their deaths on me, Phelps. Ah, but we can! He leans back in his chair, arms folded comfortably in his lap, which you would think means he's comfortable, but his head is what gives him away. He can't keep it still. He can't maintain eye contact with Cole. He finds something to look at, to the left, or to the right. Then he'll briefly look at Cole, then look down, before gulping. But more than that, we have evidence that he's lying. You're lying, Courtney. The other guys aren't smart enough to attempt something like this. You either give it up, or I go after Jack for it. And how do you prove that, Cole? We have two pieces of evidence that prove his guilt. The first is the shooter's notebook that has his name and description inside, or the note that we found on Driscoll's body, which also has Sheldon's name inside. Both notes prove that Courtney Sheldon was the one meeting with Mickey about the morphine. We know about your showdown with Cohen. We found notes on your guys. Cohen is hitting our old unit. He believes we have the morphine. I told him that we don't have it, and that's the truth. Isn't it, Doc? I believe, Mr. Sheldon. I think he's telling the truth, Detective. Whoa, Courtney almost gave it away right there, but Fontaine salvaged it like the cool customer he is. We know from the newspaper flashback that Courtney used Fontaine to dispose of the morphine, so Fontaine knows exactly where that morphine is. But Fontaine answered in a way so as not to incriminate himself. I believe, Mr. Sheldon. I think he's telling the truth. All very subjective. Next, we'll ask about the Cool Ridge robbery. You were on the ship, Sheldon. Yes, that's correct. So you had opportunity. But it doesn't mean that I was involved. He's right, it doesn't mean that he's involved, which is why the third option, lie here, is not the best one. A better option would be accuse, because we have all the evidence we need to accuse Courtney of a crime. If we were trying to accuse him of lying here, we wouldn't have much to go on. His body posture is not very incriminating. He sits up straight, hands in front of him, meeting eyes with Cole. Yes, he does look like he's trying a bit too hard, and that in and of itself might be incriminating. But we are going to accuse him of a crime using evidence that we've gleaned elsewhere during this case. So you don't mind that the mob executed McGoldrick, Driscoll, and Beckett to get to you? I don't know why you're trying to pin this on me. Where's your proof? The proof is Beckett's confession. His last words prove that Courtney was the mastermind. Beckett had a message for you before he died. Bad luck. It was worth a try. I feel bad about Beckett, Phelps. He was a hard charger. Those guys deserve more. I don't blame them for taking their shot. Have you finished, detective? No. I'm just getting started. You have an answer for everything, Courtney. Let's hope Jack does because now I'm going after him. Is there anyone you're not prepared to sacrifice? Jack is not in this. He's a good guy. You were Jack, Courtney. I don't care who goes to jail. I just want the morphine off the street. What are you offering, Cole? Don't be ridiculous, son. This man is gambling. What's your offer? Doctor! Good to see you. I'm conducting an investigation. Upstairs in my office. This now. man is about to confess. As of now, you're suspended from duty pending a fitness review. What are you talking about? You heard the man, Phelps. Upstairs and face the music like the hero you wear. You certainly had us fooled, Detective. Phelps, you're one of my favorite sons. You've broken this old man's heart. Sir, what is going on here? You're suspended, Phelps. And over your badge and gun. Don't keep him waiting. What is going on here? Your wife's attorney has pictures of you and the German. Compromising pictures, lad. She's pressing charges. You'll be formally charged with adultery. 
A criminal cannot serve as an LAPD officer, as I'm sure you're aware. I don't understand. How could you do it, lad? Your wife, your children, consorting with the enemy and a dope fiend at that. You're lucky the war is over. You'd be taken out and shot. The department doesn't need this kind of publicity, Phelps. A hand over the gun, keep your head down until you're bored hearing. I forbid you to make any comments to the press. What the hell were you thinking? Listen, Marie, I need to explain. Please leave. You're upsetting the girls. Let me see them, Marie. They're my daughters. Go to her, Cole. You have done enough damage here. Do you want me to call the police? For God's sake, Marie. Can't we at least talk? What is there to talk about? Do you love her? Do you? What were you thinking? What about our children? Can you imagine what this has been like for them? Go away, Cole. My father has hired an attorney and you will be hearing from him. I'd like to explain, Maria. I'd like to tell you what I've been going through. What you've been going through. I have had reporters camped out on the front lawn all morning. I can't stand it, Cole. And with that, it all comes crashing down. Cole's reputation, his marriage, his career. All because he had one moment of weakness. All because he had an affair. To restate a question that has been asked by many characters up until this point, Getting what close, were you thinking, Cole? This is completely out of character for Cole Phelps. It's something we can't help as a player. There's no choice we can make to prevent Cole from having an affair with Elza, and it doesn't make a lick of sense to me. I ranted about this during my live stream when I shot the footage for this episode. He goes into the blue room, interrogates Elza. Even if we get all of the questions right, it's not a particularly interesting interrogation. We see little signs of chemistry between the two. He learns that Mickey Cohen is having lunch at his favorite place, and what does he do? He stops the investigation, tells Roy he's going to follow up on a hunch, and that he'll see Roy the next morning, then stakes out Elsa at her place of business, stalks her back to her apartment, shows up, knocks on the door, and has an affair with her. Why? It is completely out of character for the guy. Makes absolutely no sense. Then the next morning they show up, and wouldn't you know it, Mickey is still having lunch at his favorite restaurant. Or came back the next day. So the case can go on. The media was talking all about the corruption inside the LAPD. The Brenda Allen scandal was about to make the LAPD crumble. Top brass were sleeping with the prostitute. But unlike the real Brenda Allen scandal, the top brass found a scapegoat. Cole Phelps, war hero, the public's favorite cop. They knew the media would start talking about him and conveniently forget about them. It was a sacrifice. They sacrificed Cole to save themselves, and all thanks to Roy. What are your thoughts on Manifest Destiny and this horrible plot twist? Let me know in the comments section below.
I publish new videos each and every week here on my channel, so if you want to make sure you don't miss the next one, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. If you have and you feel like you're still not getting notifications, consider following me on Twitter at Oxhorn. I update Twitter manually with every new piece of content that I publish. I have a shirt shop with completely unique designs you can't find anywhere else. My designs come on shirts in a variety of men's, women's, and children's sizes, and in a wide array of colors. You can find them on other products as well, like smartphone cases, pillows, posters, stickers, mugs, prints, etc. So if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here. If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming a patron on Patreon or a member here on YouTube. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video doing? with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon with more brand new videos. Oh, she's the pinup girl for the current campaign, seeking to raise $25 million. Little Miss Gloria Lloyd. All units, officers need help. Hollywood and Highland. Hollywood and Highland, officers need help. 211 in progress. What have we got? Three guys tried to knock the place over and got jumped. Now they got a half dozen patrons and staff for insurance. Do we know the situation inside? Two inside covering the hall.